Hello, SID attendees. My name is Jim Murphy, and I work at GE's Global Research Center in upstate New York. And uh, today I'm going to speak on behalf of the talented group of scientists that I work with who are developing narrowband phosphors for wide color gamut, high co color quality displays, and our path towards enabling next generation displays. So a lot of you might be familiar with GE's uh, KSF phosphor, also known as PFS. Uh, they both mean the same thing. Um, and that phosphor has been commercialized. It's doing quite well. I'll give you an update on that. It's won a lot of awards, some of them I'm showing here. It's also doing well in the lighting industry, but today I will be focused on displays. The remainder of the talk is where we're going in, in the future and what we will be commercializing in the near term. Uh, that includes our narrowband green phosphor, which is the picture on the right there. And then starting from the bottom left, uh, you can put KSF in remote parts for full array local dimming type of applications, some of which may contain mini LED. Uh, and then the true uh, frontier for color conversion in displays right now, which is on developing inks and eventually inkjet printing for full conversion micro LED applications. I will give you an update on that. An argument can be made that color is the biggest driver in the display industry right now. So before I get into our products, I do want to explain how color conversion happens in LCD displays. So it really starts with the LED package itself. Um, and we have three cones in our eyes and uh, one is sense it has its maximum response in the blue, one cone in the green and one in the red. And when you stimulate all three of these cones, we perceive that as a white color. So for an LED package, uh, for those who aren't familiar, to get those, the blue, green, and red, the blue color comes from the LED itself, and the emission in the display industry tends to be around 450 nanometers. But the green and the red come from phosphor. So the job of a phosphor in displays is to absorb blue light and then efficiently down convert and fluoresce that light. The green phosphor would absorb blue, blue uh, efficiently and then re-emit that as luminescence in the green, typically between about 530 and 537 nanometers. And then the red phosphor, we spend a lot of time optimizing the chemistry so that it can absorb blue very, uh, it can absorb blue well, down convert, and then fluoresce very efficiently uh, red that tends to be right around 630 nanometers. When you combine the red phosphor with a green phosphor, you mix them in a silicone and then you put them on top of a blue emitting LED, you get a white emitting phosphor converted LED package. And that is really at the heart of color conversion in the display industry. So we went into full scale production in 2014, producing our red phosphor, KSF, and the industry has really embraced it as I will show you in the upcoming slides. It is the leading wide color gamut conversion technology. Um, in approaching 40 billion commercialized KSF containing LEDs in all major display sectors, including fast response time, full array, local dimming displays. After giving you a status update on our KSF phosphor, I'll then turn for the rest of the talk and focus on the near future, where we're focused for next generation displays. So I will move on to our narrowband green phosphor development, which enables 88% REC 2020 when combined with KSF, and it's an on-chip solution. So it is, uh, is a cost-effective solution. Recently, we've made some very nice uh, breakthroughs in our R&D, and uh, such that the brightness and the quantum efficiency are now comparable to the industry standard green phosphor, which is known as beta Cylon. So that's been very exciting for us and we're now currently sampling partners. I will then move on to the direct lit market and our focus on color conversion in that area. Uh, many of those direct lit applications will contain small size LEDs. Sometimes they would be referred to as mini LEDs. So in that space, we're focused on really two things. First of all, a remote part. And so that's what I'm showing here. This picture with uh, Thomas Edison uh, in the background is a remote part containing our KSF phosphor. I'll talk about that a little bit, which has just recently been commercialized. So that's where you would mix 
as I'm showing in this little uh, color wheel here, you mix green and red and you, you get a yellow remote film with KSF plus whatever green, other green phosphor you would like to use. If your green phosphor doesn't have on-chip reliability, another possibility that we're seeing in this direct lit market uh, with products due out next year are, that involve our materials are called magenta LEDs. So a magenta LED refers to you still have the blue emission from an LED, and then the red emission comes from KSF. And as that some of that blue light will transmit through the phosphor film, and the rest gets absorbed and converted to red. And so we refer to that blue-red part as a magenta LED. And then the green would come from a remote part green. Again, you can use any green, but often what we're seeing is that the green would be something that doesn't have on-chip reliability, like a quantum dot. Uh, in particular, the perovskite quantum dots are making some very nice progress in this area. And last but not least, we are interested in micro LEDs. So this is really the holy grail of color conversion. You have to absorb all of the blue light from a micro LED and convert that completely to red. So this is the most, the biggest challenge in color conversion right now. Uh, and both quantum dots and uh, what we're here to reveal today is that uh, some of our submicron KSF, uh, we're working towards that as well. So we've developed a submicron KSF that is highly absorbing. We've also developed some inks and photoresists, and we'll show you some of those initial results. And we expect customer sampling to begin on this in 2021. So at display conferences, you hear a lot about quantum dots and you hear a lot about OLED, but you hear very little about phosphor. So I wanted to take this opportunity to let you know that the, just as quantum dots and OLEDs are getting better each year, so are phosphors. There's really been a revolution in the phosphor industry in the past five or six years. And so what I'm showing here uh, are the three generations of phosphor. So in generation one, which I'm not showing the emission spectra of an LED package that contains gen one, uh, you, it's a single phosphor solution, a cerium doped garnet phosphor. And this material is very bright. It has a high quantum efficiency. Um, but because it's so broadband emitting and it's a one phosphor solution, the color gamut tends to be low unless you filter very heavily. And this phosphor continues to be in the market today. Generation two, I am showing generation two, as I call it, uh, for phosphor uh, containing LED packages that are used in the display industry. And so what you're seeing on the left, that emission spectra, you see the blue emission from the blue LED, and then you see a green emission that's broadband, and then it's mixed that that uh, it's mixed with a the a red emission, which is typically a europium two plus dope nitride, and by adding that second phosphor, you can achieve wide color gamut, so you can achieve high color quality, but it does come at the expense of brightness, and part of the reason is because because the both phosphors are broad, you have to filter heavily. And secondly, if you look at the emission out past 650 nanometers or so, our eyes are really not that sensitive. So these broadband phosphors tend to have a lot of near infrared emission, which re result also result in lower brightness. The third generation of phosphors, uh, what I would say is really, you know, post 2013. So in 2014, certainly by 2015, these were hitting the markets. Uh, you can see how different the third generation look relative to the second generation. And the main change is that we shifted towards narrow band phosphors. And so what do narrow band phosphors do? You can see the big valleys between the blue and the green and between the green and the red. That red spike of uh, light uh, emission that you see there right peaking at 631 nanometers is our KSF technology. And you can see that past 650 nanometers, there's really no emission. So uh, the big valleys between the green and the red and between the blue and the green mean that you need less filtering to have saturated colors. So you you will have wide color gamut with less filtering. Um, and so this enables you to have both high brightness and high color gamut. So that's really what narrow band phosphors allow you to do. Any kind of narrow band color conversion material enables more efficient, brighter, wide color gamut displays. So with that background information, now I would like to start speaking 
about our products. So an introduction to our red narrow band red emitting phosphor known as PFS, uh, known more so in Asia as KSF. It is potassium fluorosilicate doped with manganese in the four plus oxidation state. And you can see there are five main peaks with the peak emission occurring at 631 nanometers. So that narrow band red emission, it's five peaks, all of them below two nanometers in full width half max allow for very high color quality. It matches DCI-P3 and REC 2020 requirements very well. It is it has very good reliability, uh, so it's an on-chip solution. That means it can handle the high temperatures and uh, high blue flux uh, conditions that the, uh, a color converter material would have if it were on chip. It's ROSE compliant, uh, unlike some of the quantum dots that contain cadmium. Um, and it has no design modifications because it's on chip. You can pop that out for a Gen 1 or Gen 2 type of phosphor and put it right into your display, not having to change your architecture uh, by moving towards a remote part or anything like that. Uh, we also think it, it is an advantage to be stable in air, and so it does not require encapsulation. A license is required to use this phosphor from GE. Uh, when combined with a blue LED. And so we think this is a, a you know, th this is the material that is really being embraced by the industry. It's cost effective, it's commercialized, and it provides very nice color quality. Okay, so where can our technology, KSF, be found today? The, the industry has spoken and uh, they have chosen KSF as the dominant wide color gamut color converting material. It's in all of the display sectors. Uh, it's in smartphones by all of the big players. This is a slide I did show at SID last year. I didn't update it this year because of uh, COVID. I wasn't able to get to electronic stores uh, and, and really map this out. But so what I'm showing in the smartphones here is this is the, uh, it's, it's in the iPhone uh, uh, 10. It's also in the iPhone 11. And this article down here uh, shows that Although OLEDs are making progress and getting into uh, smartphones, we're holding up quite well there. And the iPhone 10 is outselling the iPhone uh, 10 OLED model um, very well. Moving along, what I will show you on the next slide is an update for this year on laptops. I was able to make it to one electronic store and check out the laptops and monitors. So I'll update you on that. But Long story short is we're really doing well in this display sector. Anything that relies on batteries, uh, KSF tends to be chosen for wide color gamut solutions because of the high brightness, uh, which would result in long battery life for a wide color gamut solution. And it's in gaming laptops most recently, so it has a very, uh, the response time, uh, it, it can be very fast. What limits the response time in any LCD type of display is the liquid crystal, not the phosphor. In the tablets, uh, same thing there. Uh, it's in iPads, it's in tablets by Samsung, Lenovo, etc. It's doing great there. And then finally, in the television space, um, a lot of people don't know, this is the one space where, where quantum dots do have, uh, I'm not sure what the penetration is, but it, it's certainly much lower than the penetration of KSF into the television space. A lot of folks might not know, but the top-selling Samsung TV of last year anyway, uh, I, I, I haven't checked this year, it was uh, a, a KSF-containing TV, not a quantum dot-containing TV. So these TVs do very well. It, um, the Sony put out a full-array local dimming TV. That is really nice, for example. It's 4K HDR. That's what I'm showing here. Uh, it, they can attain DCI-P3 greater than 96%. In the monitor space, they're hitting DCI-P3 space of 100%. So it's really everywhere. This is an updated slide reflecting where KSF is in the display industry in 2020. So I'm focusing here on laptops and monitors. And that little schematic we have off there on the left is showing, again, we've penetrated TVs, monitors, tablets, laptops, and phones. But uh, and whereas quantum dots are primarily in TVs, a, a few monitors are out there. Um, but when battery and power consumption and cost matter for wide color gamut solutions, KSF is clearly chosen in this particular electronic show, this top row of laptops, for example, they are all gaming laptops with fast response times and uh, high color quality. 
Uh, I think there were 10 gaming laptops that were being sold and KSF was in six of them. And the other four were all broadband phosphors. Um, it, looking down at the second row, creators, graphic design artists, uh, a lot of products by say MSI and Apple, for example, uh, color quality really matters. And so in these type of monitors and laptops, uh, KSF technology is in there to achieve color gamuts that are 100% DCI-P3 and 100% Adobe in some cases. And then moving along to maybe more traditional laptops, the two-in-one laptops by Lenovo, Hewlett Packard, uh, Microsoft Surface has been using it for years, uh, Dell, um, and, and moving right along here down to the bottom row. Um, so it, it, we're very happy to see it to be across product lines from all the way from affordable laptops all the way to very high end products that are very high performing. So it's really doing great in this market sector. So with that snapshot of where KSF is currently in the display market, I want to just summarize some of our progress to let you know that we're not done yet. Uh, even for our conventional type of displays, we continue to have improvements at both pilot scale and production scale. And so we have a lot of patented technologies where as the years go by, we continue to make improvements and it becomes a matter of performance versus cost. So in more challenging applications, uh, we are there to suit our licensees needs uh, so that we, we can meet their performance goals. So uh, things like we have very good control now over both very large and very small particle size. Uh, we've worked to improve our absorption by more than 30% versus when we first went into production. We have even more reliable material now that is reliable under both conditions of high temperature and high humidity. Uh, we can now take this material and actually put it in water, what we call a dunk test, and so expose it to water. Some of our licensees may use water jetting to dice their 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 phosphor coated wafers, um, and we've improved the material greatly, dunking it in water. Uh, that's how how stable this material can be. And finally, uh, we have some patented technologies around dispersibility, so that we can our material can be compatible in multiple different types of hosts, uh, so it flows freely. It's unagglomerated. So with that snapshot of the current status of KSF, I hope it's become apparent that it has really penetrated the display industry in a very strong way, and we're going to be here for a very long time. So I don't mean to show it with this slide here that we're done in 2020 by no means. It's just that we're very well established. The rest of the talk, I want to focus on where we're going next to ensure our dominant dominance in the wide color gamut space as we move into the future. So I'll move through this quickly because I've already shown some of this information on an earlier slide, but I just want to share the GE Innovation Roadmap here. What I'm going to move on to next in the talk is our progress on narrowband green phosphor, which will allow for very wide color gamut technologies that work well, even for REC 2020, when using combination with KSF. And then I'll shift back towards next generation KSF type of products. For example, right here, uh, KSF was just recently commercialized in a remote part. A fourth area of focus for us is the KSF that would be on chip, but with no green phosphor in the LED package. The green phosphor would be in a remote package, some something like a green quantum dot. And these products are expected to be commercialized in 2021 and offer the widest color gamut uh, that would be available today. Very exciting developments there. And last but certainly not least, uh, we are focused on KSF, submicron KSF development for micro LED applications. So we, are, we have developed inks and we've been inkjet printing and we plan on sampling customers in 2021. The purpose of this slide is twofold. First, to show that the entitlement of KSF for wide color gamut displays is higher than that of the commercialized red quantum dot that is found 
at least in the United States, which is indium phosphide. And secondly, it's to show the importance of using a narrow band green phosphor with our KSF technology. So REC 2020 calls for very, to, to attain high REC 2020 color gamut, you need narrow band red emission centered around 630 nanometers. So that's what we're showing on the left. It is true that with quantum dots, you can, you can change the emission of that quantum dot based on changing the size of the quantum dot in synthesis. But the industry has spoken, and as you shift to 635 or 640 nanometers with your quantum dot, it's been shown that you're going to take a hit in brightness. And with the push towards HDR, and in some instances where, that, where battery becomes important, that hit in brightness is not acceptable. So when you compare a, a red emitting quantum dot, this is an actual commercialized quantum dot from a TV brand I went out and bought at the electronics store in 2020. Uh, there are really only two companies that are making them that I have found at least on the floor and on electronic stores. This is one of them. Both of them are actually similar, though. They, they're, they can, the red component is an indium phosphide quantum dot with a full width half max of more than 40 nanometers. Um, and when you normalize that versus a KSF containing uh, TV part, it, the difference becomes very obvious. I mean, without getting into the science too much, you just look at the figure on the left. And what we're showing is the emission spectra of PFS in red our KSF technology versus an indium phosphide quantum dot, that emission spectra is the orange spectra. And you can just see that it's, you know, that KSF is significantly more narrow. And so what does that mean? Well, that means if you look towards the right now, we're looking at the color coordinate diagram here and the red dot shows KSF and the orange dot again shows this commercialized quantum dot. Uh, and, and this really shows the entitlement because we're just focusing on the red here. And we're also showing different color spaces. So the green triangle you're showing is NTSC. The red triangle represents DCIP3. And that orange uh, portion of a, a triangle is, is showing uh, REC 2020, which, as you can see, is a much, it's about 37% larger color space than DCIP3. And that is a movement in, in color conversion technology to be able to color, uh, to be able to cover more of that REC 2020, even though we are in REC we are in 2020 and there isn't a lot of content that's uh, available. I don't, I don't know if there's any you know, content really available that is uh, REC 2020. Nonetheless, that is the goal. And so for, for many products. Um, and so um, what, what this is showing is that the, you wanna look for each color space at the tip of that red coordinate. And that represents ideally where you would want the color coordinate of your color converting material. And so you can see both meet um, NTSC and DCI-P3 color spaces well, but um, you know KSF technology gets much closer to the entitlement of uh, REC 2020. And so the bottom line is that it has uh, it is more narrow emitting than a commercialized red quantum dot, and therefore it has the potential to have the widest color gamut, a wider color gamut than red quantum dots. So why doesn't it sometimes? It's because of the green. And so let's look at that gray, that gray triangle that's just a sliver below the DCI-P3 color space. So what happens? Well, the main green that's being used in the for phosphors uh, right now is called beta silon. It's a very impressive uh, phosphor, for, uh, very reliable. It's on chip has, um, and, and it's, it's rather bright. Um, but it has a tail that goes onto the red emission. I'll show you on the next slide. And that tail that gets into the red pixel tends to pull that color point from the entitlement of KSF down to that gray triangle. It still produces a very impressive uh, product. So it, you, know, you can hit 100% DCI-P3. I think it looks like it's a sliver below in this particular product. So maybe this one is 99% DCI-P3. But very impressive products and, and really all over the display industry like I showed previously. Um, but if you move to a more narrow band, narrow emitting green, you can get close, you, you would have less of that bleed through into the red pixel and you would get closer to the entitlement of PFS. And so that's what I want to show you. Uh, this is a slide that represents our current progress on narrow band green phosphor. So looking at the emission spectra in the upper right there, what we're showing you are two emission spectra, two different LED packages. The first emission spectra in black 
is a conventional LED package that contains our KSF phosphor technology. You can see that spike of red emission at, centered at 631 nanometers combined with the impressive beta Cylon uh, phosphor. And you can see, if you look at that beta Cylon, you can see, start looking out towards 600 nanometers, 610 nanometers, and you can see the emission never really goes back down to zero. So there's there's a little bit of a, a, a of that green emission that gets into the red pixel. And that's what pulls that color gamut away from the, the KSF entitlement um, to produce very, remember, wide color gamut is 90% DCIP3. So we're still hitting 100% DCIP3 uh, with that, but we can do better. And so that's what we've done. So if now if you look at the red emission spectra, you still get that blue emission from the LED. But now look at the green. We produced a material that instead of having, uh, that's more narrow than beta Cylon. And um, by using this material, you can see there is no green emission tail that's going into the red pixel. And so you, you're closer to that KSF entitlement on the red color point when using this narrow band green. And so the end result is pretty impressive. Uh, we can now get 88% REC 2020 when, when using this green in combination with KSF, over 100% Adobe and 100% DCI-P3. And it's on chip, so it has very good reliability. And that on-chip reliability means all you need is just a little bit of green and red. You mix them in a silicone, you put a little dab on your LED. So you're covering less than what would be less than 1% of the screen area with luminescent material, as opposed to remote parts that cover almost 100% of the uh, screen area. So it's, a, uh, it's also worth pointing out that our material, that this new green phosphor by GE, absorbs more strongly than beta silence. So you could use a little bit less to get to a given color point. And so we really think this is going to be a cost-effective solution. Uh, the big breakthrough of the past year is that we've been working on this material, optimizing the chemistry, and, ha and have now a quantum efficiency and high temperature and high humidity reliability that matches beta silence. So we've begun customer sampling just recently. And if you'd like to learn more, please contact us. So now shifting gears back towards our KSF technology, what are we working on for next generation displays? I'll start off by mentioning a talk that really had an impact on me one or two years ago at a conference in Asia. And the keynote speaker from a very prominent display company covered color, uh, covered LEDs and made a statement and had a slide on that said, the future of displays is size diversities. And he went over how displays are going to be more lifelike and they're going to be everywhere wearables. They're going to be small size displays, large size displays. And I want to build on that by saying that display size diversity requires LED size diversity. And then build on that even more and say LED size diversity requires phosphor size diversity. And in particular, LEDs are tending to move towards smaller sizes. And where we define, you know, chip scale packages and then go down to, you know, what, what's defined as a mini LED versus a micro LED. Uh, you know, I've seen different definitions. I don't know. But, I, but the point is, that as the LEDs are getting smaller, so does the phosphor so that we can coat them evenly and coat them very well. And so we've done this. So um, so there's really three different areas of concentration for us, for us in these small size LED spaces. The first one we think is the most affordable and easiest to integrate is good old phosphor KSF on a uh, small size chip. So you basically just, uh, what we're showing there is an SEM image of our phosphor material. Um, where we decrease the particle size by uh, greatly and still have a quantum efficiency above 90% uh, in comparison to some of these uh, quantum dot solutions where in some of these parts, the, the quantum efficiency can be below, say, 70%. So, um, so this is, we think, going to be the most affordable solution. Underneath that, I'm showing some small size LEDs there. Um, and so again, it's just a little bit of red phosphor, a little bit of green phosphor, and you mix it in a silicone and you put it on top of these small size LEDs. So you don't need a lot of it. So it's affordable. Um, and as we go small, we still have good, we, our materials air stable and it's very reliable to high blue flux and, and it's thermally stable. So we think this is going to be the bulk of the mini LED market. Nonetheless, there are, other, there are other areas of interest. In display types where KSF might be combined with 
a green phosphor that doesn't have great reliability or in a situation where you have the, really the highest nit uh, extreme brightness with best in class high dynamic range, uh, great contrast ratio. Some of our licensees have engaged us on combining KSF with a green phosphor for a remote part. And that again, that green phosphor can be something conventional or quantum dots. Um, you know, works very well for a, a green phosphor that doesn't have as good of reliability as KSF. Uh, here you're looking at a 70 centimeter uh, long commercial commercialized KSF part that is used in a computer monitor. So this just hit the market this year and you'll see more of this to come as full array local dimming type displays uh, are, are commercialized in the upcoming years. And what I did here is I took a blue emitting uh, flashlight that I had and I put it underneath the remote part. And, and I did have to use a filter because it was so bright that I my, my iPhone saturated. So there is a, a cutoff filter on here that's making the image maybe a touch more yellow than it would actually be if you saw it. But I put half the flashlight underneath the remote part and the other half uh, just going directly to my, my camera. And so you could see where it's not the flashlight is not overlapping the remote part. You can see that blue emission from the flashlight. But for the remaining LEDs that uh, that emit blue light that are go passing through the remote part, you can see that that blue light, some of it transmits all the way through, and the rest of it gets absorbed and converted by the green to, to green and to red by phosphors. Um, and so uh, this is uh, an exciting development for us, and uh, we believe we're going to see many more of these products uh, in the upcoming uh, years. And a third way to do color conversion in direct lit type of applications uh, that we are very focused on and interested in um, are this magenta LED. Uh, it's a hybrid solution. So there's no reason that quantum dots and uh, phosphors are always in competition with one another. This is a very elegant solution that I've been speaking about for several years at conferences. Uh, and this hybrid solution is our KSF technology on chip, so it's on a, on a blue LED um, because it has good reliability. And then you use that in combination with a green quantum dot film to generate your white light. And the quantum dot, you put the quantum dot in the film so that it ha and because it's encapsulated and it's remote, so it experiences uh, a lower level of blue flux and that gives the product uh, good reliability. Um, the, your green quantum dot can be cadmium containing quantum dots for countries that are okay with that. Um, but what we're really seeing most recently are perovskite quantum dots that are even more narrow than cadmium containing quantum dots. And the picture I'm showing here um, on the right is, uh, is, is I have the, the citation below. It's by a company called Nanolumi and they are combining KSF, uh, a magenta LED. You could see that below the part. And then you can see the, the color conversion remote part um, where it's green where it's not being illuminated by the magenta LEDs, but then as that magenta passes through that green film and you get the green luminescence coming out the other side, you now attain that white. And so if you look at the emission spectra, um, you see that nice valley between the blue and the green and the green and the red, because now you're using both a narrow green and a narrow red. Uh, and in that blog, uh, Nanolumi says that they can attain uh, REC 2020 greater than 91%. And there are many other companies that you can find public information on this type of architecture as well. Uh, Avantima spoke at SID a year or two ago. Um, TCL put out this, uh, uh, one of the authors is from TCL that put out this paper that we're also citing here where they show that they can attain 95% uh, REC 2020 using KSF on blue LED plus perovskite quantum dots in their backlight. So from uh, expect products in this area in 2021 and the, they will have really outstanding color quality. Okay, folks, here we go. The Holy Grail. So I've been speaking at the SID conference since about, I think, 2014. And the way that I felt in 2014, how, you know, I had questions as I'm presenting and I'm thinking, how much will KSF penetrate the market? And then as 2015 and 16 came and it became apparent that it's penetrating very well, um, then the questions went on, will, will KSF ever 
can we decrease the particle size and keep high brightness? And then the answer was yes. And then it moved on to, can it work on a mini LED? And the answer is yes. And can we, will we ever see remote part products? And yes. And it, can we develop a narrow band green? And we're making some nice progress on that. Um, this is the first time I'm present. I, I, it, it's been a fun journey, but this is the first time I'm presenting on uh, the potential to use KSF for micro LEDs. Will we get there? I don't know, but it sure has me excited the way I've been excited in the past about um, some of those other technologies that are now um, very close to commercialization or have already been commercialized. So let me make the case for for, for KSF and inks. Um, so GE, we have some patented technologies that enable us to go to very small size, very high absorbing types of KSF. We believe we're the only company in the world that can do this. Um, and so what I'm showing in this uh, graph here off on the left is we're graphing quantum efficiency versus percent manganese. And think about the higher the percent manganese, the higher the absorbing, the, the higher the absorbance of the material. And so typical KSF, that's that straight line with the with the solid squares. But look at the other curve, uh, which is uh, triangles, and that is how that we've worked very hard over the years of, to optimize the chemistry so that we drop the particle size, we increase the absorbance, we minimize defects in our materials. And that allows us to go to very high uh, manganese concentrations that allow us to have very high absorbing materials. And that's exactly what you need for micro LED applications because you have to absorb all of the blue light. It's not like a magenta LED that you just have to absorb a portion. So this is really a challenging feat. And we're we're doing we're doing really well. Um, so I'm showing you a picture here of our ink, um, and a lot of our tests we will do that are kind of quicker are on spin coated films. Um, and so I'm showing you from that ink we can make spin coated films. But off on the right there, if you look, that is an actual. We are now inkjet printing, and this is really really interesting and fun type of stuff. Um, so we're we've now been making some submicron synthesizing submicron KSF, putting it in into an ink. Uh, they're air stable and they, you know, they don't require encapsulants. Um, and what, what the picture I'm showing you is the GE monogram. It's about 25 millimeters in diameter. And you can see off to the upper left of that, that picture, um, you can see the, the ink is, is right there in the cartridge. Um, and and um, we have a movie on this on the next slide. I, I can't include it in the uh, presentation, but but we do have a movie to show you on this. So are we there yet? No, but I will say we've made very good progress. Uh, we've decreased the particle size um, to be submicron and the quantum efficiency is still quite good. We think we're at a point where we're gonna be sampling customers this ink in uh, 2021. And if you'd like to learn more, contact us. And what we're working towards here is continuing to have high quality inks that we can print smaller and smaller features to eventually get to print features that are down to you know maybe something like uh, uh, 30 microns or so to really enable coding micro LEDs well and and converting that blue light into red light. So more on this in SID 2021, I hope. So originally this slide was supposed to show you a video of inkjet printing KSF. Um, but because of the COVID and having to do this virtually, it's not compatible with this uh, venue. So um, I have a separate attachment that should be with this. I encourage you to click on that and you should be able to see a movie on inkjet printed KSF. Um, and also, I, if you uh, find me on LinkedIn, very soon, I think GE Research will be posting video, and I may, I will, I will forward that onto my LinkedIn account, so you can see the video if you're uh, uh, then if you're unable to download and watch it for uh, on on this at this conference for any reason. Okay, folks, you made it through my presentation. I thank you very much for your attention. I'm sure that the transitions are awkward at points. I've never done a virtual conference pre-recorded before. So thanks for your patience there. Um, in summary, I'll just say that, uh, you know, I that we believe that phosphors will continue to be the dominant color conversion technology in next generation displays. We think we're well positioned for color conversion in next generation displays. And we're focusing on five areas that I've went over in this talk. So in short, we make we will continue to make improvements on our KSF that serves the bulk of the display market, uh, continual improvements at production scale. Uh, we are focusing on a narrow band green phosphor and our 
just beginning customer sampling of this, so this has us pretty excited. We are developing um, small size, high absorbing KSF that ha is very bright, has very good quantum efficiency for small size type of LEDs, uh, you know, mini LEDs and remote parts, as well as uh, um, uh, magenta LEDs that can be used along with quantum dot films and hybrid type of solutions to give very wide color gamut solutions. And finally, really on the frontier here, uh, we're very excited about our progress on using our highly absorbing submicron KSF in inks uh, and thin films for micro LED applications. So more to come on that in uh, 2021. If any of this interests you, uh, we love to talk to companies, we love to collaborate. So please feel free to contact me uh, at murphyj at ge.com at uh, GE Research. And then you can also contact uh, GE Licensing, uh, rachel.cassidy1 at ge.com. So again, I want to thank you for your attention. And I, I really want to thank, uh, acknowledge my, my team. This is us at our Christmas party. Um, Pre-COVID, I miss those days. Um, so thanks, uh, everybody on the team for your contributions to this work. And uh, I'll just finish by saying here's a partial list of some of the our, our patent family around uh, the KSF family. Thank you for your attention and stay safe and healthy.